Hello. I apologise, I haven't got a lot of time to make a video so there's no wonderful green um, screen behind me with lots of flashing images etc coming up. Um, so I'm going to bring you this very quick video um, from myself speaking um, about a massive breakthrough in the science world that has sent quite a few shockwaves um, and about the kind of work that is going on behind the scene, up scenes. I can accept that some people would be a bit nervous about <clears throat> use the term playing God because that is what we, we are trying to do now we're trying to find out every little living cell we don't know everything yet but we're getting there and how with, with biology works we need to understand what, how chromosomes work if we can take a chromosome from a, a bacterium and then we can put that into another cell if that, if that chromosome and hey presto a new species is born from it but I brought you two videos in the last few months, Evolution is Simply Biology and Evolution is Simply Biology Part 2. And I mentioned about Craig Venter, um, who is the owner of the Human Genome Project, um, obviously mapping out the full human genome and chimpanzee genome, and then basically matching in, it's almost identical in every single marker going along the um, huge screen they had there, um, which is a very impressive thing to do. So basically creating new life, absolutely new life. In a laboratory, we have changed one bacterium into another, but not like I brought you in my videos, Evolution Simply Biology Part 2. After the incubation period, we can start to look at the data analysis, and there are several common evolutionary developments shared by populations of these bacteria. We can measure against the ancestor strain, which has increased hurriedly at the beginning, but slowing off after so many generations. Colonies or populations, if you like, evolve larger cell volumes and lower maximum population densities and all become specialised for living in certain conditions. But not all of those populations are fully successful and some decline in their fitness relation to the ancestor strain when growing in different substances. Therefore, these bacteriums have developed defects and can no longer renovate its DNA, greatly causing an escalating the velocity of additional mutations in those strains. We've taken from the ancestral strain into a new environment. They've adapted, they've changed, but we can still match it back to the ancestor strain. So I brought you those videos. Um, I'm not going to go much more into details now, so I'm going to play you um, the videos that are coming out now on the internet about this massive, massive breakthrough um, on um, Professor um, Venter creating synthetic life. This is a huge step. One would actually class this as one small step for man. That's how this is, a, this is a big thing for science. Um, but it is again further evidence how life on this very planet has evolved and is forever evolving. Thanks for watching. Lars. I actually believe this is going to be a very powerful set of tools. Uh, and we're already starting in numerous avenues uh, to use this tool. Uh, we have uh, at the Institute ongoing funding now from NIH in uh, a program uh, with Novartis to try and use these new synthetic DNA tools uh, to perhaps make the uh, flu vaccine that you might get next year. Here we have an American scientist, a, a controversial scientist called Craig Venter, who has announced tonight, this evening that he has created an artificial bacteria. Now what he did was to take the DNA out of the bacteria, make his own DNA on the lab bench, totally synthetic, and then used yeast cells to put that all together into a long chain, which he injected back into the bacteria. And effectively it booted up this empty bacterial cell to take on a whole new life form produce completely different proteins. It was a, a form of life that's never before been seen on the planet. What sort of applications could it have if it all moves on from here? Well, he says that by being able to design specific life forms, he can create life to do very specific tasks. So the oil spill, for example, you might be able to design bacteria that munch, back, uh, munch up the oil and leave no trace. You could also design bacteria to create biofuels, green energy for the planet, we need that. Uh, and also new chemicals, new drugs, perhaps even new food ingredients. All these things could be created by enormous vats of fermenting bacteria. Just turn on the tap, you get the stuff out the other end. Incredible. Um, 
had this come sort of out the blue, or did we know that he and others were sort of working on something like that? I mean, he's put millions of dollars of this, and it is really 15 years of, of his work that has led us to this point. It's called synthetic biology, and there are other groups working on this around the world, but he is the first. He is the man who has really opened up a new chapter where we're not just looking at life that has evolved, but also life that has been created on the laboratory bench, and it opens up whole new ethical dynamics too. What is life? Is it uh, uh, stuff that has evolved? Is it man-made? What's the distinction between uh, life and machines, for example? Uh, and other issues, you know, if you can create life for innocent purposes, can you also create life with bioterrorist potential? Extraordinary. Um, is it at a fairly early stage, or is it near to the point where he could put it to practical use? Well, I mean, it's all one thing to be able to contain something like this in the laboratory and prove a, a principle that you can create life this, like this. But of course, you would then have to examine the environmental consequences. If you were, for example, to try and release this into uh, the Caribbean to mop up the oil spill, could a bacteria, an artificial bacteria, have uh, uh, effects that haven't been foreseen by the scientists, but have ramifications that could completely upset the ecosystem?